Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. So turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the chair in front of you. Turn to page 980 in that Bible. 980. So vision 2020. Pastor Brian, it's 2021. Well, hindsight's always 2020, but that's not really what that's about. We actually introduced Vision 2020 three years ago, began to preach on it, began to, in, uh, to, to explore that and move that direction. Back in 2018, when we introduced Vision 2020, we said it's a, it's a direction, not a destination. In other words, we may or may not get there by 2020, but even if we do get there by 2020, we're not going to stop. That's the direction that we're heading. And if you have a bulletin, Vision 2020 in its entirety is on the bottom of the bulletin. It, it, it consists of four elements, being led by biblical elders. And that was the initial focus, was the elders recognized that we got to get right in order for the church to get right. We can't expect the church to, to be transformed if the elders are not transformed. So we've moved to a biblical eldership model, meaning that our men truly are uh, qualified according to 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, meaning specifically that our elders teach and our elders preach. And this past year, I'm proud to say that nine of our men stood in this pulpit and preached to you, proclaimed to you the Word of God. That is, in my mind, that is a mark of a healthy, healthy church. One young man, uh, two Sundays ago, caught me as he was walking outside and says, he said, Brian, I'm so grateful that our church is led by several godly men, not just one. You see, he gets it. He knows that several godly men will keep a church on track, but just one man in charge might lead us off. And that's why I'm here, because I want to be at a church that wants and values biblical eldership. The second aspect of Vision 2020 is, uh, is uh, oh, what is it? <laughs> Meaningful, membership. Meaningful membership. Give me that bulletin. I don't want to do that again. First lady, everybody. That's right, meaningful membership. And you just witnessed that this morning. You witnessed uh, people coming together saying, I'm with you, you're with me. Uh, once again, the New Testament presupposes that a, that a Christian will be meaningfully connected to an identifiable body of believers. You'll hear me, you will hear me say that again in my sermon. But the Bible presupposes that if you are a Christian, you will be meaningfully connected to a local church. And we started, that, we started that emphasis about two years ago. And then uh, last year, COVID threw everything into a spin, and really there was no real way for us to go out into the community. We were shut down completely for three months, and then, and then we barely were able to be open uh, for the next year. And so community impact was, tra was swapped with family transformation. And what we recognized is that when the, sh when the church shut down, many of us didn't know what to do with our spiritual life. We, we didn't know how to feed ourselves. We didn't know how to lead our families in worship. And so last year, we, we did a three-part sermon series called Family Worship, and we still encourage uh, you to be doing family worship at home. That is something, that is a lost tradition of the church. That is nothing new. Uh, that used to be a, a staple of the church, even in the West, even in the United States, family worship. And now we get to this place uh, impacting the community. We believe that the Lord wants the church to impact its community. God has placed us here in this community at a specific time, in a specific location, for a specific purpose, to change the world around us. We believe that. And so as, I've, as I have wrestled with what does it mean to have community impact, what does it mean to be among the most impactful churches in the Quad Cities, I really struggled with the idea, well, how, what thing can we be best in the Quad Cities at? What event, what program, what can we offer that's the biggest and the best in the Quad Cities? And then I began to remember that we live in a cancel culture. And so it doesn't matter how much good you do, whatever community service project, whatever community uh, uh, resource you provide, if you don't toe the lines of the culture, you're canceled. And so I felt, I felt like, okay, so there's this rub between I want us to be impactful 
And I believe the Lord wants us to be impactful, but we're not going to uh, change with the ever-evolving cultural mores around us. So how do we do it? Well, the answer is simple. The Lord reminded me that we're going to impact the community the way the church has always impacted the community for 2,000 years. We're going to do what the Bible tells us to do. We're going to get serious about following Jesus Christ. We're going to get serious about discipleship. Amen? Now, look, I believe that this is a difficult time to be a Christian, and so does Jim Daly, who is the uh, president of Focus on the Family. And in an email I received from him, it says, it's tough to be a follower in Christ, uh, of Christ in today's world. Do you agree with that? It's tough to be a follower of Christ in today's world. Immorality is celebrated. The claims of Scripture are disputed or ignored altogether. The very idea of absolute truth is frowned upon. In so many ways, the tide of culture seems to be against us. You feel that, right? You feel that, right? The tide of culture is against biblical Christianity, but it is at that precisely those moments that God shows up, Jim Daly says. It is precisely at those moments that God shows up. He says, time and again in Scripture, we see God using the underdogs to advance His kingdom on earth. Revival does not start in the corridors of power or the halls of government. It starts with regular men and women, people like you and me, living their lives faithfully and demonstrating Christ's love to their friends, neighbors, and colleagues, end quote. You know, what Jim Daly captured in that email is exactly what we see in Acts chapter 17, verse 6 and 7. It says this, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is nothing, uh, excuse me, there is another king, Jesus. The accusation against the first disciples was these men who are turning the world upside down have come here also. And Jason, one of their own, one of their followers, has received them. And, ah, oh, the audacity that they would proclaim that there's another king, Jesus. Wildwood, that is how we will turn the Quad Cities upside down. Proclaiming that there is another king, Jesus. Government is not king. Self is not king. Jesus is king. And when people genuinely believe that, when disciples of Jesus genuinely believe that Jesus is king, then we will impact our community. And I believe that that's how the Lord has used his people for 2,000 years, and it's how he will use Wildwood Church to impact the Quad Cities. A bunch of regular men and women living their lives faithfully, obediently, boldly, telling people around us that there is another king, Jesus. The passage that I believe that the Lord has brought to my mind for this particular vision series on community impact is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So we're going to sort of camp out there for the next three weeks. So if, if you're in Philippians, then we're going to be in Philippians 2 this morning. We're going to refer back to, chapter, uh, to verse 27 but we'll mostly be in chapter 2. Specifically, I believe that the verse that will rule the day for us in this regard is verse 5, where Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, there are things that follow in verse 6 through 8 that are humanly impossible for us to do. What, what follows is not possible for us because we, verse 6, are not in the form of God. And therefore, we cannot even begin with a presumption that we would count equality with God a thing to be grasped. No, that's about Jesus. When Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, this looks back. See, people think, well, the mind of Christ is sort of like that bracelet that many of us have had, maybe as a teenager, that says WWJD. 
right? And what would Jesus do? And so the mind of Christ is sort of like this, this theoretical thing, you know, that you sort of apply. Uh, you just ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Will you do that thing? But Paul gives us a very specific explanation of what the mind of Christ is in verses two through four. When he says, have this mind among yourselves, it looks backwards, not forward. Verses six through eight are how Jesus demonstrated the mind of Christ. So verses two through four is the prescription. Verse five is the command. And verses six through eight is the description of what that looked like, the illustration of what Jesus has already done for us. Now, when Paul says have this mind, the word means attitude or mindset. It's a way of thinking. It's a worldview. So when, when you see have this mind, I want you to think have this mindset, have this attitude, have this way of thinking or this worldview. And specifically, he used the verb form of the word, which means this is not an intellectual thing. It's not just something that you affirm, but rather it's something that you act upon. This having the mind of Christ requires action. James 2.20 says, faith without works is what? Is dead. Faith without works is dead. You cannot say, well, I have the mind of Christ, but I don't act on it. I think like Christ, but I don't live like Christ. No, it's a mindset. It's a change of thinking that results in a change of living how we live life. In verses two through four, we see the specific mindset that Paul commands for us to adopt. Once again, in verse six through 11, we see the illustration, the example that Jesus modeled for us. So the mind of Christ is a threefold attitude. Paul, ta- Paul lays it out in verses two through four, threefold attitude. Let's, let's read that, and then I'm, I'm gonna get into it. Verse two says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ. And then he goes out and he, and he shows how Jesus did these things. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you, disciples, followers, or at least interested in following you, interested in learning more, interested in knowing what this is all about. We come to you today, and Lord, I pray that you would help our hearts to be receptive to your word, help us to humble ourselves before your word. And Jesus, I pray that you would change our minds. I pray that you would use this series and this process, Lord, to change the way we think. And if you change the way we think, you'll change the way we live. And Father, right now, I want to pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, Lord, who are facing unimaginable persecution and terror and anxiety, and uncertainty. And Lord, I I pray that you forgive us if we take for granted the uh, privilege of gathering together in safety and in comfort. 
I pray, Lord, that you would use what's happening in Afghanistan right now uh, to open the eyes of your church all around the world, and especially in America. Lord, help us to not take for granted what you have given to us. Forgive us, Lord, where we are asleep at the wheel. I pray that you would wake us up. Help us to get serious about what it means to follow Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you would protect our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, uh, around the world, the church is being persecuted. I pray that you would give them grace and strength. And I pray that you would embolden them as well as us to stand for the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So in verse 2, Paul calls for unity. He exhorted every church that he wrote to to pursue unity. Paul knew that disunity, this is John MacArthur, John MacArthur said, Paul knew that disunity among his people deeply grieves the Lord. Do you realize that? That disunity in the church deeply grieves the Lord. The Lord cares about the unity of the church. Paul wrote to every single church to pursue unity. Going back to MacArthur, he says, it should be every pastor's, every church leader's, every Christian's prayer that men will not tear asunder what God has divinely joined together in the body of Christ. It should be our prayer and our effort that we would never divide the church. Why? Because it is Satan's goal to divide the church. Why is it Satan's goal to divide the church? Because a divided church, a fractured church, is a weak and impotent church. A divided church will never focus on its gospel mission. A divided church will only ever focus on nursing itself. You, do, you break your leg, what is your focus? Nursing your leg back to health. A divided church will always lose focus on its mission as long as it's divided. It will be internally focused, and Satan loves an internally focused, divided, fractured, impotent, powerless church. Paul knew that. He encouraged every church to pursue unity. Now, let's just be clear. When, when, when Paul wrote about being united, he wasn't talking about doctrinal things or things that, that the Bible is very clear on. Where the Bible is very clear, that's it. There's no room to disagree where the Bible is clear. What Paul is talking about is on things that the Bible is not clear, personal choice, personal freedoms, things that the Bible does not clearly spell out, things that we might consider uh, open-handed issues or matters of conviction of the heart. Paul gives us three types of unity in this passage. The first is unity of affection. Verse 2, he says, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Now, we're going to see three parts here. Having the same love. Having the same love. That word is agape. Agape is a total commitment. Now, listen, I'm going to rock your worlds a little bit. You don't need agape to love people that love you. You don't need agape to love people that make it easy to love. Agape is a form of love that you need to love people that are unlovable. Agape is a form of love that you need to love people that are undesirable. People that rub you the wrong way. That's where you need agape love. And Paul tells us to have the same agape. I guess Paul knew something about the dynamics and workings of a local church that everybody's not going to be easy to love. Everybody's not going to be easy to get along with. Everyone's not going to see things the way you see things. Everyone is not going to have your personal convictions and your priorities, right? Agape says love them anyway, because guess what? The Bible tells them to love you in your stinkiness as well, right? Right? Thank God for agape. I don't like to agape you, but I sure expect you to agape me, right? Right? Look, agape love, the kind of love that, that unites people, 
of various backgrounds, of various ages and stages of life, of various philosophies. That is compelling. The world has a certain type of love. I will do for you because you'll do for me, and as long as this is good, then I love you. But when I don't love you or when things are not good, then we'll just go our separate ways. No fault divorce, right? Agape love says no. You're going to love people that are unlovable. It's unconditional. And in order for it to be unconditional, it sort of implies that you don't like the conditions that are presented. Agape love. But look, as long as you try to do this in your own strength, then you're going to fall short every time. What you need is a changed mindset. Paul says, have this mind or this mindset, which is yours in Christ. We need a change of attitude. And how do we do that? Well, the Bible says that we are renewed, uh, that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Well, I'll just get different friends. I'll just get a different church. I'll just get a different spouse. And then I'll be able to love. Wrong. Get a different mindset. Get a different attitude. Get a different way of looking at other people around you. When you commit to loving people unconditionally, when you say, Jesus, I need you to transform my mind through your word, then you will begin to develop an agape love for people that are unlovable, that are hard to get along with, that rub you the wrong way, that irritate you a little bit. Now look, this is not an optional thing for the Christian. What what I'm presenting to you is not optional. Jesus gave a command in John 15, 12. He says, this is my commandment. Jesus does not say, this is my suggestion for a happy life. This is my commandment that you love one another. How? As I have loved you. Now, do we know how Jesus has loved us? I mean, is that a WWJD? Well, maybe he loved us when we agreed with him. No, the Bible says that we were dead in our sin and trespasses, that we were enemies with God. So how did Jesus love us? Well, Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So how do we love someone with agape love? How do we fulfill the commandment of Jesus? We love people even when they're still sinning against us. Oh man, that's tough, isn't it? I love you as long as you love me. But you start sinning against me, you start offending me, you start thinking differently, differently than me, you start, you start having your own convictions in ways that are not my convictions. I'll just carve you out. Carve you out of my life. Remember that Paul is speaking to a church. We are a body. Talking about this, us, right here. This. See, when when this comes together, these people that are diverse in our backgrounds and our ages and our experiences and educations, and we demonstrate to the world that we love each other in spite of our differences, that is compelling. The world doesn't get that. Second, Paul says, be unified in spirit. He says, being in full accord. The word, there's one word that we get full accord. In one word, in Paul's day, it was a word that described individuals who were soul with soul. Paul's command to the church is that you be soulmates. Hey, all right, soulmates. You got 500 soulmates around you. Now, that's what you ought to be striving for. That that's ought to be what we are pursuing as a church. You want to be faithful, Wildwood, yes or no? You want to be faithful? Okay, be soulmates. That ain't automatic, is it? 
The, the, the most vivid depiction of that word, of being in full accord, being soulmates, is found in a marriage relationship. Now look, hold up. I'm not saying you're married to everybody. I'm just saying that that's the best illustration of what it means to be a soulmate. It means trying to get to know people. When you have made a commitment to pursue Christ-like love for the people that you are connected to in a body, and you say, I want to get to know you. I want to understand you. I want to, I want to hear you. I want to, I want to understand why you're coming at this problem the way you're coming at this problem. I want to understand your perspective. That has a, a, a way of unifying people. But remember, it's not automatic. You have to have a changed mindset. Because trust me, there will be people that disagree with you on just about everything. And if your condition for Agape love and being in one accord is that we all see things eye to eye, that we agree on everything. You're never going to be unified really with anybody. Spouses, is there any disagreement? Yeah, amen. Not in my house though. Gotcha, busted. Every one of you that raised your hand, busted. But look, when you truly get to know someone that you have chosen to love unconditionally, you will value them. Do you see? You'll value them. This is about seeing value in the people that God created and connected you to. And if you value someone, then you'll bear their burdens. Their burdens will become your burdens. Galatians chapter uh, 6, verse 1 and 2 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, someone's making bad life decisions, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. You should care when your brother or sister are stumbling in sin. But look, Paul says, keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. You got that log in your eye. You're trying to do uh, surgery and get the speck out of your brother or sister. Be careful, right? First deal with your, the log in your eye. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Folks, we ought to be burden bearers of one another in one accord, soul with soul. And the best way to be united in spirit, the best way to walk soul in soul is to be united in purpose, having one goal, moving the same direction, fighting the same fight, which is exactly what Paul says as he finishes out verse 2. He says, and one mind. There is nothing superficial about the unity that is formed between people that are fighting for the same cause. That is a real unity. I can promise you that there is solidarity between every service member around the world and the Marines on the ground in Afghanistan today. I don't know them. I've never met them, but I'm with them. And their fight is my fight. There's solidarity when you are fighting the same fight. What? Amen. With all the diversity in the church, and again, I pointed out as I presented the new members, single women, single men, married couples, older, younger, different backgrounds, different philosophies, all coming together saying, we want to be part of this church. We're with you. You're with us. With all the diversity that we experience in the church, it's important for us to maintain the big picture of why we are knit together in the first place. What is this? Why do we do this? Is this just something that we do on the weekend? Paul describes the church as a body. You know, an eye, when it is detached from the body, is gross <laughs> and dead. It does not see, it does not perform a function outside of the body. But an eye attached, properly functioning, is a blessing to the body. Just wait until you lose the function of an eye. And you will recognize how important your eye really is. 
but your eye cannot hear. You need an ear for that. Paul describes the church as a body, and we are connected in a meaningfully, a meaningful way. And in the same way, church, Wildwood Church, we need you. We need each other to fulfill the calling that God has given to us as a body. You know, there's not a single soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman, and is it a space forceman? A, sp a space trooper? I, I don't know. But there's not a single, we'll call it, there's not a single warrior in the United States military service that is out there doing his own thing or her own thing. Every single warrior is connected to a specific unit and given a specific job. See, some people think, well, I'm a Christian. I don't need the church. Now, it wouldn't make sense for a soldier to say, I'm a soldier, I don't need the army. I'm a Marine, I don't need the Marines. I'll just go out and do my own thing. No, in the same way that an eye needs a body and a body needs an eye, we need you. And you need us. We need each other to do the, the mission that Jesus has given to us. If Wildwood is your church then you can count on the fact that you have been placed here by the Lord himself. That Jesus has put you into this body and says, this is your mission, this is your function, this is your purpose. Are you searching for that? Are you looking for that? What do we call a, a part of the body that does not function? Dysfunctional? Disabled? right? It inhibits the function of the rest of the body. If my leg is broken, the rest of my body focuses what? On the broken leg. We need you. You, if you have been placed in Wildwood Church, now I realize there's a lot of you that are visitors this morning, and I pray that the Lord says, yes, this is your church. But right in this moment, I'm speaking to the people that the Lord has already said, this is your church. You have been assigned to this body by Jesus Christ himself for a purpose. We have a mission to achieve. Now, let me ask you, have you ever considered how you contribute to the mission success of Wildwood Church? You're like, okay, all right. Where do you want me to volunteer? And let's get this over with. But folks, that's the wrong question. That is the wrong question. The right question is how does every part of my life contribute to mission success of my church? It's not just what do we do in the building. It's how does this church impact this community? And it's not primarily our programs that's going to change and impact the community. It's going to be 600 disciples of Jesus going into the community and having impact in their own spheres for the glory of God in the name of Jesus. Amen? That is how we will impact the Quad Cities. Not with flashy programs or exciting events. 600 disciples saying, I am a follower of Jesus. I'm going to obey Jesus. And I'm going to tell people that there's another king whose name is Jesus. You should be asking yourself, how can I redeem every opportunity so that I am helping and contributing to the purpose of the body to which Jesus has connected me? When I go to the gym, I have an opportunity granted to me, and I want to redeem that opportunity. Every morning, I remind myself, this is a privilege, it's not a right. It's not a right for me to just spend my money and spend my time going to the gym. It's an opportunity. And what's it an opportunity for? Well, my physical health allows me to be available to help other people, perhaps even to protect someone at some point. It's also an opportunity for me to invest in and mentor my younger workout partner. 
It's an opportunity for me to encourage and build relationships with people that work out at the gym with me so that maybe at some point that results in a gospel conversation. My discipline to get up every morning and to exert physical effort is a way for me to beat my body and make it my slave the way Paul says. Now, it would be easy for me to just say, I go to the gym because I go to the gym. I go to the gym because I want to. But that's not the way a disciple thinks. A disciple says, I do only what the Father wants me to do, and everything that I do ought to be done to the glory of God. Yes, including going to the gym. Yes, including your small business. Yes, including the way you raise your kids, the way you love your spouse, the way you interact in your neighborhoods, what you post on social media, what you put on your car, the way you drive, what you wear. Everything ought to be to the glory of God. That is the mindset of a disciple. I'm going to redeem every opportunity that I have been given to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain, knowing that when, whatever you commit to the Lord, it is not in vain. It is a means of bringing glory to the Father. Is that how you think? Or is, is your concept of, of, of your faith bound by these four walls? Is this the fullness of your expression of faith? Brother and sister, you are missing out on so much. This is a pep rally. This is a recharge to take the hill in the name of Jesus, to go into your workplace, to go into your gym, into your neighborhoods, into your family, and say, Jesus loves you, and I love you, and I'm for you. J.D. Greer, the uh, former president of the SBC, Southern Baptist Convention, made a classic illustration. He says, Sunday morning service is like the quarterback calling the play. And everybody huddles around and, and they get the play. And then Sunday morning service is over and the players say, beautiful play calling. What, a, what an amazing play. I've never heard anybody call a play like that before. That, that was an amazing play call. And JD's like, no, run the play, run the play, go out and run the play. That's what it's about. If all your spirituality, if all your faith life is, is just this, you're missing out on so much. There's so much more for you that God wants you to be connected to. So what is the purpose around which we should all be unified? What is the mission of Wildwood Church? Like, like, like what should we be doing in the world? Well, we don't have to speculate. The Bible tells us plainly what every church ought to be doing. What every church ought to be doing. It's called the Great Commission. Now, how we articulate the Great Commission is found on the bottom of your bulletin. Once again, First Lady, thank you for my copy of the bulletin so I don't have to worry about jacking that up. But look, Wildwood Church exists to connect people to God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We preach the gospel here. You heard three pastors preach the gospel this morning. Pastor Matt in the baptism. Pastor Andrew in his worship inter I, I I love it that Pastor Matt can't even do a 30-second talk without preaching the gospel. It saturates our church. It's what we're about. 
We preach it at every opportunity. And you teach it at home. Amen or ouch? You teach it at home. First of all, you teach it to yourself. Every day you should be reminding yourself that you're a dirty, nasty, rotten sinner who is saved by grace. Well, that'll change your life. No one has ever sinned against you the way that you have sinned against God. You preach the gospel to yourself, and then you preach the gospel to your family. You teach the gospel. You speak the gospel when you rise, when you walk, when you lay down, when you're sitting at a table, when you're in the car. You just speak the gospel. It just saturates your life. You share it with your coworkers and gym buddies and drive through attendance and friends at school. You just share the gospel. You ask the Lord, Lord, would you give me an opportunity today to encourage someone with the gospel? Do you know that you can ask that prayer? You can ask that? Lord, give me an opportunity to encourage someone today with the gospel. You think that God's going to be like, nah. <laughs> nah, not today. No, what, 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 what usually happens is, one, we don't ask that, and two, we get so focused on ourselves during the day that we don't see the opportunities when they rise. So what would be a great follow-up? Lord, give me an opportunity to, uh, to encourage someone with the gospel today and help me not be an idiot. Help me to see the opportunities that you give and help me have the courage to take them. I'll trust you with the words. I'll trust you with how I do it. So many of us don't want to mess the gospel up. It's like, just do it. Just tell the gospel. Jesus saves dirty, nasty sinners like you. And he can save dirty, nasty sinners like him. Right? Number two, we connect, others to, uh, connect people to others through discipleship. The reality is that we are not called to live life on an island. We're called to live in community. And we connect people to others through discipleship. We get connected to adult Bible fellowships, which usually happen uh, when we have two services. Uh, Wednesday night Bible studies, which we're launching uh, this coming Wednesday night, men's, women's, and a couple's finance. Wednesday night studies, uh, connect groups. You'll hear in the coming weeks and months uh, opportunities to get into smaller discipleship groups one-on-two, one-on-three groups, one-on-one, one-on-two. You draw people into relationships, so you get connected, and then you draw people into relationships, into discipleship relationships. Hey, you should join me in my connect group. You should come with me to my ABF. You should come with me on Wednesday night. I'm really learning a lot, and maybe you would learn a lot too, or I'm going to disciple you. Would you like to be discipled? You don't have to know everything to disciple someone. You just got to know a little bit more than them and be willing to study the Bible and seek out answers, right? That's discipleship. Number three, we connect people to the church through partnership. That word partnership is the, word, is the Greek word koinonia. What's often uh, translated fellowship. Once again, the New Testament presupposes that every single Christian will walk in fellowship or partnership with a local body of believers. And so we, we believe that you should be connected in a real, meaningful way. You should be known, and we should know you. And finally, we connect people to their purpose through service. As we grow in our faith, we become more and more like Christ. And what did Christ say about himself? He said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. As you grow in discipleship, you will grow in likeness to Christ, and that means that what you should expect is that you are not only becoming smarter about Jesus, but you are becoming a servant like Jesus. Our greatest purpose in life is in service to other people, and we'll spend some time, more time, on that over the next couple of weeks. But folks, when we recognize, when we internalize the Great Commission, and when we see that my whole life, everything about my life, is an opportunity to advance the gospel, to fulfill the Great Commission, then you are walking in unity with your church.
That is unity of purpose. That is walking in the same direction. Can, can you just imagine? I want you to get a vision here. It's a vision series. I want you to get a vision of 600 people that say we are going to prioritize God's priorities for our life. We are going to make everything submit to Jesus. We're going to redeem every opportunity that we have. We're going to do it all for the glory of God. And we are going to go out together. We're walking in the same direction. We're fighting the same fight. We're united in purpose. Don't you think that would unite you in affection and cause you to be soulmates with each other as you share how the Lord is working in you and through you? I got the privilege of being part of a rescue mission this week on Facebook Messenger. I didn't leave my office, but I can tell you that as a result of, of, of being connected with certain people and, and taking small steps, that an American man is on his way out of Afghanistan today. There is something unifying when we are on the same mission when we're walking the same direction. And why should we do this? Like, why, why ought we to have the mind of Christ? I'll tell you, it's simple, because Jesus did. Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He gave up his equality with God. He humbled himself, becoming like a servant he was obedient even unto death, even death on a cross. Jesus does not ask you to do for him what he has not already done for you. As we move into the uh, Lord's Supper here and wrap things up, I want you to reflect upon what does it actually mean to celebrate the Lord's Supper? What does it actually mean to receive the elements of communion. The Bible tells us that the, the wine, the grape juice is symbolic of the blood of Jesus poured out for you. That's what it costs Jesus. And the, the bread is symbolic of his body broken for you. That's what it costs Jesus. How selfish of us to say, I'll receive your sacrifice I'll receive your blood, your body broken for me, but I won't give you mine. I, I won't suffer hardship. I won't suffer uh, inconvenience. I won't suffer discon uh, discomfort. I won't suffer for you, Jesus, but I'll gladly receive your suffering for me. Brother and sister, would you humble your heart today? Receive Jesus Christ, sacrifice for your sin, and once you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, would you say, Jesus, all of my life is yours. Everything that I have is yours. Everything that I have is yours, Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. His life, his death, his sacrifice. I pray, Lord, that you be glorified in us and through us. I pray, Lord, that even now, you would move among us, open hearts, pull back the layers of hypocrisy, of pride, of anger, of, of rage, of hurt, of bitterness. Help us to surrender all of these things to you. I pray, Lord, that people would be uh, born again, that they would be uh, made new, made alive in Christ today that they would put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, say, yes, Lord, uh, thank you for your sacrifice. I receive that as a free gift of, of your grace. Please forgive me for my sin. And Lord, spare us of hypocrisy that would say we will, we will receive your death, we will receive your sacrifice, we will receive your selflessness, we will receive your humility, we will receive what you give, but we won't give it to you. Forgive us for that. And Lord, I pray that you would change our minds, that Wildwood really would be an impactful church in the Quad Cities and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I wanna encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.